All right, all right. We are going live in five, four, three, two, one. Yo, 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 tell me what you know. Welcome to the Sunshine Show. Woo! Tonight, <laughs> I have a very special guest for you guys. I have the one, the only, the most magical, the most fabulous, the most Bowie of them all, the one and only Chris Murray in the house. What's up, Chris? Hey, Sunshine. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm so stoked to have you on the show. For people that may not know that much about you, can you give us a little bit of an introduction? Sure. So uh, primarily, I'm a singer-songwriter uh, working in the realm of ska, reggae, rock steady music. And I live in Los Angeles. I grew up in Toronto, Canada, but I've been in LA since the 90s. And I had a band in Toronto called King Apparatus. Uh, we formed in 87. And we were part of the early third wave of ska in North America. And it was with that band I started to tour in America and came out to California. And when that band finished, I'd already kind of uh, connected with some things out here. And so in the end, relocated here. Uh, around that time, when King Apparatus stopped, uh, I had a solo release in 96 on Moon Records, which was the ska label in the 90s. And it was really important label. Um, so that one was kind of, it was called the four track adventures of Venice shoreline, Chris. Cause when I was just getting accustomed to LA, Venice is where I was hanging out. And I was kind of transient and it felt like a good place for transients. You know, there were a bunch of people, just all kinds of people. And uh, it was a weird, it was a real eye opening experience. I have to say as a Canadian, uh, LA is just a crazy place, period. Yeah. And like a lot of American cities are kind of crazy places. Venice has its own special kind of crazy. And back in the early 90s, uh, between gangs and the crack things still happening, like I'd never experienced that kind of reality. So at that time, that I mentioned the four track adventures of Venice Shoreline Chris. My first two solo albums were made on a four track recorder, which just used an audio cassette. Wow, and that's so cool. I had one microphone, which was called a PZM. It's like a room mic. It picks up the ambient sounds. I think it originally made for, uh, for stick it on the conference table at a meeting and it picks up everybody pretty well. Yeah. So it has a natural sound. You hear the ambience of a room and it just happened to be the, uh, the microphone I had and it's kind of lo-fi, the whole setup. So I was overdubbing, multi-tracking on this four track uh, songs I was writing as a way to demo them or just to record them because sometimes I write quite a bit and I have only the songs up here. Uh, and I'm like, if I don't make a recording, I'm just gonna forget that I even wrote this song. Yeah. So uh, that some of those recordings were made through the, first half of the 90s and I my first solo release was in 96 and when that came out I started to perform solo acoustic literally just what it sounds like playing acoustic guitar and singing which at the time the ska scene had not seen something like this before and uh I know you're a bass player and you play like rock music right I play rock but I grew up playing jazz and then the very first like real band I was in was a reggae ska band Okay, cool. So you know what's going on with, with that. Oh yeah. Well, in the mid nineties, that was like a high water mark for ska in America. Uh, so as I said, King Apparatus began in 87. And back then you'd be on the road and you'd be at a truck stop and people would see, we, most of us had shaved heads in the, in the time. It was like yeah. the ska look. We, we get out of a van, people are like, y'all a band? And we're like, yeah. And like, what kind of music do you play? And we're like, ska. And they're just like, and then, so you try to help. It's like, it's kind of like fast reggae. And some people get that. Other times people are like reggae. So at the time we started, ska was really not well known, unless you were a fan of the two-tone bands, the English bands, yeah. like the specials and Madness. That's what turned me on to ska music. So there were some people who knew, but they were usually, 
you know, in their teens and early 20s. It wasn't something that everybody knew about. Sure, because you, sorry. No, no, go ahead. So, because you said that you were part of the third generation, the third wave of ska. Can you briefly uh, explain to us what the first and the second okay. wave of ska were? Definitely. Uh, so, what ska started in Jamaica, it's a Jamaican predecessor to reggae. It's really the grandparent of reggae. And it, uh, I think the first, it depends who you talk to, but the very end of the 50s, or 1960, that might be the very birth of ska, or the first time the word was used in Jamaica to describe the sound. And it really grew out prior to that in the 50s and the 40s, how Jamaicans typically received their music. Uh, a lot of people didn't have electricity at home and that type of thing. Um, at, was at the dance hall where a sound system operator who, if you had a sound, that meant you, brought your own speakers, your own equipment. You rented a space, a lawn or a hall, and you set up your stuff and you played records. And people came out to dance to the records. And it was very competitive as far as um, what drew people to your sound instead of the next was you had the music and exclusivity was really uh, key. So even at, at that time, before Scott, people would send spies to the other dance hall to peer over the DJ's uh, shoulder, like, what's he playing? And <laughs> to counter that, they would scratch off the label info. So spies, were, we couldn't tell what it was. Oh, wow. <laughs> and at this time, there was not really a Jamaican recording industry. They were playing primarily American music. If you had a radio, you might be able to pick up a New Orleans station or something with good weather. So people were hearing a bit of uh, American R&B, and that's the type of thing, maybe big band swing stuff uh, coming out of World War II era. Uh, the, the producers, the sound system operators would take trips to America to buy records and bring them back, and then they'd obscure what they were. Um, or they would make uh, arrangements with U.S. Um, military sailors coming through the ports in Jamaica. Like, you come back next time, bring some records, and I'll buy them. So they were, Jamaicans were listening to American music. And there is hmm, a mythical uh, anecdote that, so in America, there was a time when rock and roll for, by and large, replaced R&B. Okay. You know, uh, not to say R&B went away, but rock and roll became the thing. And so they say, well, Jamaicans didn't really like rock and roll. They liked the other music, but it, the supply from America kind of stopped or really got less. So as a result, that's when Jamaicans started to record their own music because they couldn't get what they needed from uh, America, but they could get exclusive tracks by actually making them. Oh, wow. And so that was like in the Scott era was really when that blossomed. So at the same time in the early 60s was when Jamaica achieved uh, independence from Britain. I, so I'm from Canada and Jamaica, both Commonwealth countries. Uh, I think in Canada, even we had some final formality in the 70s where no longer did we need to send important legislation to Britain for approval or something like that. So within my lifetime, these things were happening where uh, Jamaica was becoming an independent nation and ska music became a huge success. Like I would say the first pop music of Jamaica. Before that, the styles that people were actually playing were more like hand drumming, for sure. Um, and there was a style called mento, which rhythmically is kind of similar to calypso, but not as big band sound, more like acoustic guitar, banjo, and this thing, a Roomba box that you can sit and it's got steel tines, like four or five of them, bing, boom, bing, very like rural kind of music down home. So ska, the first wave of ska was in Jamaica by say the mid to late 60s, 66 through 68 is known as the rock steady era. So like music, like if you think how rock music changed from 1960 to 1970, huge change yeah. uh, from She Loves You to Jimi Hendrix, like hardly the same stuff. 
So by 66, again, the urban legend or whatever old wives tale of it is that they had a particularly hot summer. So ska is a pretty lively dance music. Yeah. And so the summer apparently was so hot, people wanted the music to slow down. So rock steady is a slower, a slowed down version of ska. It still features the pulse, the offbeat that we know from reggae. And by 68, 69, the rock steady craze had morphed into reggae. Gotcha. And, and so as, as a Commonwealth country, Britain invited a lot of Jamaicans post-World War to emigrate to Britain, in part because Britain had been bombed a lot in the war. A lot of rebuilding, manual labor was needed to build buildings that had been demolished by German bombs. So a lot of Jamaicans uh, moved to Britain because life was hard in Jamaica, you know, it's like, I can't even imagine like working on plantations and just being hand to mouth and real hunger. But I think, you know, a lot of people went to a super cold foreign land for away from tropical paradise. And so there was a Jamaican population that settled in Britain, working class. Um, and so they were living in the same neighborhoods as working class white British people. And they brought their music and would have events. Uh, they didn't call them sounds or sound systems so much in Britain, more like blues dances. They would be like, again, private events, usually in a basement or something like that, or a small hall. And they would be living in the same neighborhoods and playing their music. So the other, everybody was hearing Jamaican music out of this Jamaican apartment and that. So there was a fair awareness in some quarters of, of Britain of Jamaican music. And it even, uh, it got to the point where in the, as I think as early as the beginning of the seventies, there was reggae music being made specifically for the British audience. Oh, wow. And it would, or they would take Jamaican recordings from Jamaica and they would add to them. Like they would add a string section to sweeten it up, to make it more uh, Western or European sounding for those ears. Cause you know, the first time a person hears reggae, it's kind of, what is this? It's, it's different sound. Once you know it, it's, you don't have to understand anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the second wave of ska happened in Britain and there was a label called Two Tone and that was formed by Jerry Dammers, who was the organist for the specials, who were like the flagship act of two-tone. And there were about a half dozen two-tone acts. And when I say two-tone, like I was, the first release of two-tone was in 79. And at that time I would have been about 12. So just at the, and I heard that stuff right away because I went to a high school where it went from seventh grade to now you're out of high school. Okay. So the, the seniors were programming the school dances with what they wanted and they knew what was up and I was 12 and I'm just at the dance. But do you know that track, uh, Madness's version of One Step Beyond? I don't know, I feel like I should. Okay, well, it's a classic. Uh, and it starts off with this really distinctive spoken intro that lasts about 25 seconds. Like, hey you, don't watch that, watch this. And it's like how uh, a DJ, an MC in hip hop or reggae would be, you know, hyping the crowd. Yeah. And so I'm like, what is this? Cause you're at the dance, it's like a song, a song. Now there's this guy and it's like, this is sounding weird. So I really noticed it. I'm like, what is this? And then the song came on and it was this tune, One Step Beyond. And I'm like, I love this. And from that point on, I was a ska fan. I had never heard of ska before. I'd probably heard a couple of things that were in one way or another ska music, but uh, I just became an instant fan. So bands like Madness, The Specials, The English Beat, The Selector, uh, and Bad Manners, those five were the main acts that did some releasing on Two Tone. There were also a cluster of acts that had one or two singles, um, but those five that I named are really the, the classic acts. And so Scott, they had a, a successful um, time for, I would say, 79 into 82. Ska music in Britain, it wasn't, it was mixing 
elements. So it was mixing influence from ska and Jamaican music with uh, punk rock had happened a couple of years before. So for instance, the specials, one of their first tours was support for the clash. Oh, wow. And there was a, a real strong um, connection and communication between reggae music and punk music in that early punk era. Uh, a, in large uh, deal like Don Letts, do you know Don Letts? Uh, you, you might recognize him. He's like uh, an English dread, super long, kind of manicured dreads, uh, glasses. And he, at the time, punk started in Britain. Of course, when things start, there are no punk records to play at the show. So they, they had Don Letts, who was like a Jamaican guy from the sound system world of Jamaican culture. They hired him to play between bands at the punk show. And of course he played reggae. And that, so the punks were hearing him play reggae at the earliest punk shows when there were no punk records that he could or anyone could play. So punks right away were hearing reggae through Don Letts. And uh, also that's how bands like The Clash, even early on were covering Jamaican tunes. There was an awareness in the punk scene of Jamaican music through this. And similarly, uh, the connection between punk and two-tone ska, the energy, the upbeat, aggressiveness, uh, the electric guitar um, presence in, in punk came into two-tone ska. And it was a much more aggressive, uh, edgy sound than yeah. Jamaican ska. And so that second wave of two-tone ska was what I heard. And so the third wave, it's a term that has a couple of meanings in practice now. I think now it has one meaning. When I first started hearing about third wave, it was in the term of the third wave. Because if you were a ska fan in the mid eighties, it's because you knew two-tone. And it was only through two-tone that you had any grasp that there had been Jamaican ska. Because some of those bands were covering um, songs, Jamaican songs from the sixties. And you're like, that at that point when those things started to become popular, some of those original recordings got reissued in the first reissue compilations. So then you got to hear the original artists like the Maytals or the Whalers and you know, household names for reggae now, but not in the, the 70s. Wow. Um, so I was turned on to ska music through this more modern pop hybrid version of it, two-tone. And the band I started, King Apparatus, and a lot of bands of the third wave were making it even faster and more aggressive in a sense. So I would say we were less Jamaican than any of the two-tone bands, still ska by our own estimation of what ska was. And so that started in, you know, anything that happened after two-tone, early people in that scene said, well, this is the third wave. Like, wow, there are 20 bands, something's <laughs> going on, you know? Now there are hundreds and hundreds of bands. Yeah. But uh, at the time, I remember the first uh, contact made to me by, say, California, which was renowned to have a, a strong scene, was this guy, Tazy Phillips, who had a radio show called Scott Parade. And somehow he got my phone number and called me up. And it's back in those days when the phone rings and you answer it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? And... So he starts telling me who he is and I'd never heard of him, but he's like, oh yeah, I have this radio show in California and I'm creating a list of ska bands, active ska bands. And right now I have about a hundred. And I was like, there are a hundred ska bands? I was blown away. So back in the end of the eighties, it was still really underground. And I would say in uh, the US probably these days, like the Boss Tones, the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones or Sublime or No Doubt, might be the most famous bands who have some type of tie to the third wave of ska. Um, so through those bands and also say Rancid through the connection with Operation Ivy or Fishbone, uh, those, those bands, I think now most people know who they are. So in North America, those bands were really early in bringing, they were all influenced by two-tone ska. And even if their sound as bands has moved on from ska or grown more broad than only ska, uh, they all started, I believe all those bands because of a love of that 
second wave and Jamaican music. So third wave eventually became sort as a term more associated with a certain sound of ska more than, oh, here's a movement that's current. And there were, I would say one of the most influential bands in America was the Toasters. Are you familiar with them? Yes. So the leader of the Toasters also ran Moon Records, this guy Rob, Rob Hingley, or known as Bucket, uh, a guy who put a ton of work into developing Sky in North America that anyone who listens to Sky now owes him a debt of, of his work. And uh, so Toasters were a classic third wave act in that it, their inspiration from Two-Tone was so clear. They had the same fashion sense and uh, the themes often of Two-Tone were like this song called Concrete Jungle and it's about like, it's, it's not safe to walk at the street because somebody around the corner has got a knife and it's like, you know, it's tough music. So talk Toasters had that. Bit. Can we talk a little bit about the way they would dress? Sure. So um, Scoff is definitely a music that has a strong fashion. I have never been like all the way in on the fashion. Uh, <laughs> so the original um, look of Two-Tone, there, there's a cartoon character that figures in a lot of Two-Tone um, imagery and is on the front cover of the specials album. It's, it's just like this black silhouette of a rude boy. A rude boy is uh, what you would call a ska fan who is all the way in. Okay. He dresses, it's like, you know, a rocker. I always like, I wondered up. what a rude boy was. Okay, so I'll try to tie all these things together about the fashion sense and the rude boys. So all of this originates in Jamaica. So in Jamaica, the term rude boy would be like you would call a hooligan a bit. You know, why are you rude boy? You know, am I rude boy? It means he's like a ruffian, like, um, and it's usually meant used in a derogatory way, more like scornful, like your, your uncle is calling you a rude boy because you're messing up. Yeah. Like, are you being disrespectful or a rough guy? Uh, so the rude boys, you know, I've never been to Jamaica. I have a, a rose tinted view of, certain aspects of Jamaica that I'm happy to go when there's an opportunity to share music, but I do not want to go as a tourist. I've, I don't think I've gone anywhere in my life as a tourist. I've only gone to play. And that's a beautiful way to live. You show up, people are there to receive you and they know your music and you get to share. It's a lovely, lovely life. Yeah. So the Rude Boys were definitely of the slums. Uh, they were tough guys. And I think, you know, Jamaica is a third world country and as tough as American inner city can be, I think the third world can be even more ruthless. So rude boys were really like dangerous characters. And sometimes, as I said, oh, they would send spies to the other dance to see what was being played. They would send little gangs of rude boys known specifically as dance crashers. Oh, to go. dance crashers. So what they would do is they would go to the other sound system that's competing that night and they would cause problems. They would start fights. They would threaten people. And they were like, so people won't just like, we're getting out of here. It's a bad scene here. So, so the Rude Boys were that. By the time Two-Tone came around, okay, I'll go, I'll stay in Jamaica one more moment. So as I said, people would go out to the sound system. That's how they would have experienced their music. And for them, it was a night out. You know, probably Friday, Saturday, they'd dress up. They'd be looking good. We're showing up, we're showing our best, and we're like strutting, and I wanna be a peacock, because I like the way that girl looks, and you know? Just like that. So the look of people going to the sound system in Jamaica in the 60s, in the Sky era, was a little formal in the sense of people were dressing up uh, to look sharp. And so in two-tone, that dressing up kind of looking sharp in a certain style, it's kind of a retro look. They're, they'd be looking for 60s clothing, which I think at the time was not hard to find cheap in you know thrift stores. Yeah. Like if it's in the 70s and you want to get something from the 60s, like that's somebody else's garbage, you know? And she you can look good as a rude boy. And so I think that 
in the two-tone era, that's when I first heard the ter term root boy. Um, and my first association was like, that's just, that's what you call yourself when you're a ska fan. And it, you know, in practical terms it was, cause I, I guess I considered myself a root boy because I was a real ska fan. I loved this music. That was the, I was repping it all the time, but I wasn't wearing suits. Yeah. You know, cause to me, I, my, my personal life, I was taking to church a lot as a kid and forced to wear a suit and I just, I have a little resistance to wearing a suit. I'll do it when I have to, but it's like, as soon as I get home from whatever it is, I'm like that, that's off of me. <laughs> so I'm a, I've always been a little like more jeans and t-shirt than the sky scene. So you, so you just rock the hat and then just kind of casual. Yeah, a hat will go a long way in yeah. the sky scene. <laughs> it's all about accessories. <laughs> yes, so that character I mentioned, the cartoon character, he has a name, Walt Jabsko. Oh. Yes, that's a little uh, factoid. So here's, here's an interesting um, thing to tie it all together. That character is drawn, modeled on a photograph of the whalers so it, from the early 60s. So the, uh, back in the early days of Ska, the whalers, Bob Marley, were a vocal trio, Bunny Whaler, who just passed, uh, Bob Marley and Peter Tosh, those three singers. Were, there were a couple others who were there at the very beginning, and, but pretty soon it came to three for a decade or more. And uh, so in this photograph from one of the, like an album artwork for a Whalers release, could have been like 63 or something. Peter Tosh, he's got dark sunglasses, he's got his suit and his, his hat, and he's looking sharp when he's like strutting. He's like, you know how Peter Tosh always has this like, I'm a, I'm a hard man, you know? He's looking bad. And so while Jabsko, that cartoon character is actually like drawn, modeled on that image of Peter Tosh as a rude boy in 63. So really Two-Tone drew very directly a lot of um, influence and detail from the original wave of Scott. And I would say the third wave in the, kind of did the same, but one step removed. For instance, King Apparatus or the Toasters were taking a lot of influence from Madness or the Specials. And less so, at least initially, like when King Apparatus started, I didn't know nearly as much about Jamaican ska as I do now. I knew about reggae because I grew up in Toronto and Toronto is a reggae city. Outside of Jamaica, Toronto is the third largest Jamaican population after London and New York. Okay. Again, a Commonwealth country, it was easy for people to immigrate from Jamaica to another Commonwealth country. Um, I think more difficult sometimes to come to America. Um, and Toronto, when I grew up there, probably had about 3 million people. There, was a, there were little pockets around the city, like here's like Little Italy, here's Chinatown, but here's where the Jamaicans are. And it didn't take a zillion of any ethnicity in a, a region to be a presence. And there were enough Jamaicans in Toronto that they would bring Jamaican artists directly from Jamaica to Toronto for a live show, Ooh. just to Toronto. And then they go back to Jamaica. It's not like, oh, they have to be on tour in America and then they're coming up to Canada. So I was able to see just because I got into reggae almost in a parallel fashion to ska when i first heard madness and, and that type of ska i understood there was some relationship with reggae but it's quite different than reggae especially in the 70s R roots reggae from the 70s is a is one monster ska is a totally different thing two-tone ska is even a different thing from that so i was always digging reggae and even before that, I was like a blues fan. I think Roots music has always appealed to me uh, for whatever reason. Somebody likes this and they like that, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I was hearing a lot of Jamaican music just living in Toronto and able to see a lot of the foundation artists who were hit makers in the 60s uh, when they would come to Toronto, probably at the end of the 80s. 
I would see them. Um, and there, there would be shows where it might be a thousand people at the show and maybe three quarters of them are Jamaican Canadians. So it was a really great opportunity. And I didn't realize until I started really traveling that this is not the way in the world that Toronto was special in this way. Uh, and I was really afforded a, a great exposure to this music that I didn't even know how great it was at the time. But I saw a lot of artists in like the end of the 80s or 1990, who later, decades later, I crossed paths with in Europe or here or there. Um, and I forgot the original question, but this is generally a theme about the waves of sky. I, oh, I think I was saying that King Apparatus um, took the starting point more from the two-tone bands, which were more already more electric guitar oriented. There's not a lot of electric guitar or rock influence in Jamaican ska. Uh, so we were even faster tempos, um, a little more frantic, I guess, in a sense, than the two-tone stuff, which is a step towards Jamaican music, which is straight up groove music. Um, so that's a real long answer of what are the, the three waves, but it has like a bunch of aspects. Chris, oh my God, wait, I gotta pop in here really quick. Uh, I'm gonna turn down this volume. Uh, which is a step uh, I love that one question took 30 minutes to answer. Like that was the best answer that I've ever got in my whole 54 episodes that I've had wow. this show. <laughs> wow. You rock. <laughs> Um, let's see some of the people that have been hanging out with us um, in the comments. We got Wizfire, Marcio, Eugene Bradley, Juan Love in the house. Juan Love, I see you got the Rasafari on. Yes, I'm all decked out. He had a cell, so I hit that cell up. Juan says, here is the Watt Jobsco influenced emoji. I wish that I could show it to you. Um, I can't, but let's see, what does it look like? Looks like a little guy doing something. I don't even know how to explain it to you, Chris. You'll have to check it out when we get off of yeah. the interview. <laughs> Mike Guzman saying this is some amazing information. Everybody's super impressed and so excited to, to hang out with you tonight. So thank you for hanging out with us, Chris. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, we got Stephanie Joe in the house. What's up, Steph? Um, that's so just in the house too yeah i know we had kind of chatted before we went live and we were talking about how i saw you probably about 12 13 years ago in austin when i used to live there and i just remember on like my ipod i had um vic what is his name rick no vic ruggiero the slap rick, rick, rick say it again ruggiero ruggiero <laughs> Um, the Slackers, the Bandulus, Ryan Scroggins, and the Trench Town Texans. Like, oh my gosh, thinking about like just that like group of musicians just like takes me to like a whole other time in my life. Um, let's just talk a little bit about what the transition from Canada to LA was like. And then once you got here, it seems like you just started rocking and rolling. You've been on tour everywhere. You've played with people like Prince Buster, just to name one. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about it. So I would say uh, the first time I ever set foot in LA was in the beginning of 93. And there was a special thing that was happening in Los Angeles and in, in California, like the ska scene overall in California was very strong. Um, from, from the two-tone influence bands like Operation Ivy, Fishbone, The Untouchables were three of the very earliest bands that from their influence, the whole generation of the Skeletones and Skank and Pickle and Let's Go Bowling. Oh, I love Skank and Pickle. Right? So there was a strong um, Southern California and California ska scene through the 80s relative to other places. Like, as a ska fan in Toronto, we thought New York has a really good scene. Uh, Boston has a good scene, Chicago and California. Those were the four places that were like little hotspots at the time. And, and people in the scene understood that. And there weren't that many bands that got in bands and did the touring around because there just wasn't so much uh, ground support for it in a lot of these places in between the Northeast and California. But uh, sorry, what was the original question again? Oh, oh, just, uh, just about the move. 
yeah the transition overall. and then like once you hit uh united states like how you just like took off rocking and rolling because it seems like you never stopped once you started yes so when um i mentioned the the history of my first release came out on moon records so that was an american record company and i knew bucket the leader of that company because king apparatus and the toasters had done uh some touring both in canada together and also we did a west coast tour with them in 93 at the beginning of 93 that was the first time i came to la i was playing on a tour with the toasters nice. and so when i uh started doing solo stuff right out of the gate i was connected with moon records who ha had done my release and many of the the top level headline acts that were there like in the mid 90s uh king apparatus had played shows with them so i had personal uh connection with a lot of people in the ska scene in the us just because we'd come down and done a lot of touring or if uh, like skank and pickle they all camped out in, on the floor of my apartment for 10 days as they did dates with king apparatus around southern ontario probably in 92 wow so these these were people that like oh yeah you crash on my floor, I crash on your floor. You got a gig? Yes, yes. Uh, it was the ska scene was still small enough that, like, if you were really in it, you knew the people who were really in it, and if you were good, you had to be good to get respect from the people who were good. Sure. And you know, to be humble about it, I would say King Apparatus was a good band. <laughs> As you know, Let's Go Bowling and Toasters, there were a lot of really good bands. So. When we had played with bands, we'd made good friends with them because they're like, you guys are a great band. And we'd be like, let's go bowling. You're like a great band. So right out the, the door, I had the release on Moon Records uh, and most of the top acts in the US ska scene at the time were releasing through Moon. So through my personal relationships with band and also through um, Moon's involvement, helping to promote, like it was at the time where record companies actually still like work to promote and, oh, we're sending review copies to physical fanzines. It's pre-internet, right? <laughs> oh, this, this guy in Utah has a ska show. We send him a copy, you know, and uh, everything was very DIY and underground. So being with a label like Moon, even though the network is very, I want to say, not thin, it's not like a beefy network yet, but it's widespread. The net is there, just the cables are very thin. Um, so it was a good place to to start working as a solo artist in the US uh, for those reasons. I had good support from label and, and after Moon Records finally like shut, uh, shut down as a business, uh, my next releases were with Asian Man Records who is Mike Park from Skank and Pickle, who as I said, oh yeah. Uh, Mike said, after Moon shut their doors, he's like, you know, if you ever want to release a record on Asian Man, doors always open. So uh, it was just like that through friendships with people. Then I was doing stuff with Asian Man. And I would say my first release with them came out in 2000, perhaps, which put me on uh, the Plea for Peace tour, which has been something that I think that they changed the name later to something else. But it's a tour that ran for a number of years, a package tour, of, at least in the first year, it was all Asian Man acts. And so in 2000, I went out playing solo acoustic on a bill that the main headliner was alkaline trio okay and they had they had been an asian man act but they were just signed to vagrant but the vagrant release hadn't come out yet they were blowing up i'd never heard of them because i was like really into ska reggae stuff um the, a band from chicago called blue meanies was on the, the tour a band from st louis mu330 band from the bay area link 80 um Angela Moore from Fishbone was on some of the California dates doing his Dr. Mad by poetry. Nice. And a couple more bands from Chicago, Lawrence Arms, still around, uh, punk band, and another band called Honor System. They both had members, as, as did Alkaline Trio, all three bands had members who had been in an earlier band called Slapstick, okay. which was a ska punk band uh, on Asian Man. So I went out and some of the shows were big, like, these these bands were popular and they drew similar and different crowds and so 
I had, it was, I guess, you know, good fortune as a result of having done a lot of work in the past because King Apparatus had been a band for eight to nine years and we worked hard and uh, in the last, bunch of those years we were making our living from it at a time when trying to make a living from being in a sky band was really like a hard go yeah but you know uh bands bands are always doing it for the love the bands that do it for the love don't care about sleeping on a floor or they don't care about there's six of us in a van with the gear and you stink because you get the shower <laughs> you know they don't well not to say that they don't care at all but they're willing to put up with all kinds of hardship for the thing that they love. And uh, so I think that it was as a result of doing something, putting a lot of energy in with love that I had good relationships and good opportunities come to me. Oh, yeah, I 100% believe that. Um, you seem very, very passionate about what you do. And just hearing you talk about it, I see and I I hear the passion coming from you. So, yeah. Um, so, Weege is saying in the comments here that Skanking Pickle, are they from San Jose? I think so, yes. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. Okay, so my very first card that I had, I had um, the Green Skanking Pickle CD. It might have been the self-titled CD. I'm not really sure, but that's the only thing I would ever listen to. Like I just, from the beginning to the end, over on repeat, on repeat. It's wow. such a good freaking CD. Oh my gosh. I remember first time seeing them. It was a freak show of a band. You, really? Did you ever see them live back no, in the day? No, no. Lovely people, very eclectic group. <laughs> uh, a lot of, individuals and characters and they had at a time this wasn't the way in Scott all as I said Scott kind of had taken this aesthetic that was looking sharp in a, a retro way and and tough in a, in a street kind of way there were certain aesthetics to Scott that Scott Skank and Pickle blew wide open they came from that they they, they were fans of that but they were, I think, very conscious and like, that's not what we're trying to be. Because I would say that in the same moment as a lot of bands took that influence, there were some bands who were so focused on those details, but didn't have the music to back it up. You're, it's like, okay, that's great. You look nice, but you know, you can't lay it down. So a band like Skank and Pickle wasn't trying to succeed at that. We're trying to look like a ska man or, or meet those expectations. Um, we're trying to stay within the realm of ska and yet do something entirely novel. And so they would have, uh, so they had that tune, Asian Man, uh, where like Mike, who's Korean American, uh, what became like Asian Man, the character of the song. And if there's like some superhero stuff going on stage, Jerry, one of the trombone players, there was another song, I don't remember what it was, but they had a chainsaw and they'd taken the actual chain off it, but it's still functional wise. And he was, he got into character as Hulk Hogan. He's a huge guy, Jerry. And so, you know, they're thrashing out and he's like, <laughs> he's like, he's being the Hulkster. <laughs> and then he, he fires up this <laughs> chainsaw and he's like, in some kind of, trance like a wrestler you know like hyper acting and the chains are like loud and you get you smell the fumes and stuff and he gets off stage and he's like wow and he's like attacking people with it just like the wrestlers would attack someone with the chair that they ripped up but it had no chain so it wasn't hurting anyone but it was like they were a freak show i remember that the bass player for some stuff yeah like this unicycle he'd be like playing bass on the unicycle are you serious they were they were like a nutty nutty band. I gotta it, I gotta find my footage of this. It's got to be out there. It's got to be out there. Sadly though, like you were saying, like how things are different now from in earlier times. Now with camera, uh, smartphones, awesome video quality, stuff is streaming live to the to the world always. But there were so many things that happened before that technology became everybody's technology that if you weren't there, you just didn't see it. 
sometimes you'll see like somebody had a primitive a primitive camcorder or something like that oh, camcorder <laughs> yeah exactly so there is footage out there but these days a nice thing is like oh uh if something happens i i've never had the opportunity to be two people so if i'm going around doing my thing i can't also be like documenting myself doing it. <laughs> so i'm thankful that I I come back from a tour and there's like, oh, there's here in Austin, there's some stuff going on. And I remember these shows when I see other people's footage, like, oh, there's that place and that person made this joke and whatever. Uh, whereas with King Apparatus, there's not a lot of documentation of that because our last shows in the original era were in 95. Back then, no one had smartphones. No, we, I don't think I had a cell phone Maybe Ever. a car phone, a bag phone. <laughs> well, back in those days, we would just, you know, phone booths and phone cards is how we would actually like survive. We didn't have internet. So we had the map book, the road atlas, like we're trying to get to Detroit. Okay, this next 20 miles up here, we take this one. We had, you know, the navigator Dude, who's like, I, if I, it's gruff, he's, he's the one. I feel like nobody, like, I don't even think I could read a map like today if you try to give me one, you know? It's like so foreign to me now. I, I've been in in bands with, uh, sorry, in vans with younger bands where they've said, hey, why don't you come and do a tour with us? So I go out with them for a couple of weeks or something. And I, I've observed that, like people up in the front, like looking at the maps and like not knowing how to work it. And kind of arguing like, no, it's over here. It's like, and I go up, like, show me. Okay, you see here, here we're here, and here's this thing, and go up there. We, like, oh, okay. So yeah. That said, I I wish I knew how to use my phone more fully. I know how to do some things, but it's incredible to me, like the power. I, I'm just on. I have an iPhone eight that I'm talking to you through. This thing, it's like this big can do more than like a computer that used to occupy a physical room, you know? I know, it's It's so incredible. Cool. So things are different. And of course, I think, uh, as you already mentioned, how people don't need to go and experience a show in person. They can access a lot of entertainment online and be at home, which is great for the quarantine times, for sure. Uh, it's also changed, I think, people beyond just the way they uh, take in entertainment, in, in some ways that are beyond subtle even. For, so of course it's cliche now, okay, here's the millennial, you know, buried in their phone, their device, mm -hmm. kind of oblivious to the world. But there, there are studies that I've read articles about, I don't do these studies, but where as, as young people, like for instance, here's something I've witnessed in life, uh, a child who's maybe two or three being carried by a parent in a hall in a house. And there's like a photograph uh, in a frame with glass. And the kid makes this motion, like you know, he wants to enlarge the photograph. The kid can't even oh, wow. really talk, but already the kid knows this. So people are just like, that's their first reality now in a way that for me, it can never be. I'm always like still like figuring, how does this part work? Oh, yeah. I remember when one of my best friends came and visited me here in Santa Cruz and her kid at the time was not even, I think, a year old. And his favorite artist was CeeLo. And he could legit get on her phone, find the um, Apple icon and look through the artist and find CeeLo. And he's not even a year old. I'm like, what? That's wild. So, so, wild. so as far as like, still on that tip of the kid with this. I mean, when I was a kid, my TV time was limited. Like you can watch for two hours a day or something like that. Screen time was only TV yeah. and it was limited, you know? And uh, also we were told like, you don't sit too close to the TV. Like you have to be at least six feet away from the TV. Kids want to be right there. And, uh, I guess the parents understood it's probably like bad for your eyesight to be that close to the glowing box. Yeah. But they, they told you though, like back then people didn't know a lot of stuff that they know now, but they, I remember as a kid, we 
we had been told like, you have to be at some distance from the TV because it's sending out rays. And if you're too close to them, that's bad for you. Like this stuff that it's beaming out. Mm -hmm. We thought, oh, like, it's actually dangerous. Uh, but by and large, with screen time limited and some distance, you lived in the world of three dimensions. Where now, even from, from a very young age, people are looking at something that's two dimensional and it's a foot from their face or 18 inches away from their face. And so this study I was talking about was how as people are developing, young people, their ability to use peripheral vision is suffering because they're just focused on this one thing in front of them and this stuff and that they're really focused, not only on their eyes, but their men mental things right there. So something can be happening over there and they learn to tune it out. And so those ramifications of how things are different, we, we are gonna see more and more of the manifestation of that as life continues. And of course, this year of everybody isolating has so many effects that we have yet to fully grasp. Uh, I mean, for, for you and I, adults who have a way of life, we understand this is stepping away. And when life resumes, however, we'll, I'm sure integrate into the flow successfully pretty well. There might be a couple of days you're like, is it really okay to shake a hand? Uh, you know, but we'll get over it in a week. You know, once the hugs start flowing, we'll be like, oh. yeah, <laughs> yeah. But there, there are young people who are not able to go to the classroom for all the right reasons. So are not socializing um, already, as we said, or I was, I was saying like the younger generations often are like focused in their phone and at the expense of being aware of surroundings. And so compound that with people who have been literally deprived of human interaction for a year or more to come. And the effects of that uh, are going to be significant. Uh, there's going to be, you know, people who are experiencing that, at especially uh, developmental age, that will really affect how they process reality. And so we're going to have some people in this world who process reality differently than you and I do. That's crazy. Was... <laughs> like, what is going on? I am. Um... I know just for example, like my neighbors had a kid during this whole thing and the kid's turning, he already turned one and he's been in quarantine the whole damn time. Wow. Nobody has held him except for, you know, his mom, his dad and his grandma. And cause you know, it's not safe or whatever. Nobody knows what's going on. So yeah, that's a great point to bring up. That, there'll be a day that that child like is in public for the first time. And there's like 500 people around and they'll be just like, you know, I know. I, I over my life I've had some cats, and uh, sometimes like if you have one cat, it's a house cat. It might see a cat through a window, but it doesn't really ever interact with other, other cats. So if if the door's open and, and gets out, it's just like there's a cat. It just doesn't know how to deal, you know. Like, <laughs> so I think that there'll be people like that too. Like they just don't know how to deal. And I think, of course, you know, it's not their fault. Um, a lot of times in life when people don't know how to deal, we're like, what's wrong with this person, you know? And we're gonna have to uh, make allowances and be compassionate and understand what some people are, are working with in a way that maybe takes more patience than sometimes we often have. <laughs> yeah, no, I think even just people that just normal people like every, me and you and everybody who's watching at home, like even the past year has like made significant changes in people's lifestyles and just how we like react to things and how we do things. And like, it's almost like, you know, you're get you're taking a drug and you don't know the side effects of it yet. Like the side effects have not even, I mean, maybe they started, but they're not going to start really rolling out until, or they probably are, but it's just, it is wild. It's absolutely wild. What is your advice? Do you have advice for anybody who's like not being able to like 
deal with this new reality, um, having a hard time? What do you like, of isolation? You, yeah. Well, I think there are some people who are facing true hardship. Like if, if a person has, uh, their economy has really suffered, like they've lost a job and uh, they've got some kids to raise and the kids are home from school and they're stuck in an apartment in some place with terrible winter. I mean, that's a real difficult reality. So advice, I don't have advice to make that situation better. I think that as much as you, of any person can, like to be successful people, and, and I don't mean in like achieving a type of success uh, this way or that, but to be healthy people involves looking after the self. There's, there's self, selfishness that is not um, bad. Like they say, if you don't give to yourself, you have nothing to give to the next person. Um, so I think that this is a time where people maybe have a little more opportunity and time on their hands to focus on themselves in a way that is, is healthy, whether it's uh, exercise or learn to do something like I learned, I didn't, but learn to cook or learn to sew, or I've been doing a lot of gardening for me, like being outdoors in the sun um, is really helpful for my state of mind and working with plants. And over the year, you plant something and you see it start to grow and uh, you feel integrated. I, I do. Like when you have created positive influence in your environment. So for me, I've, I've settled into some positive habits that I've always had that, but not always had time to put as much energy into. Exactly. And I, I understood from the start of, of this, that as a singer, as a traveling musician, I would be a super spreader. It, if people were going to go around doing live shows, spreading COVID, I would have been spreading it a lot because every day you're dealing face to face with at least dozens of people. And you're in a room with, who knows how many in front of you and you're like uh so i'm definitely a collective mind person where it's like i want i understand different states have different paces at which things are changing um people ask me oh would you start to do small shows at this point no i don't i, I get some invitations to do some things uh even like backyard parties and I'm assured, oh, it's going to be safe and this and that. And I'm not saying that it won't be, but um, I feel for myself that I am, I haven't done that for a year. And once I get vaccinated and everybody's vaccinated that will, then I think that'll be a different potential for those things to happen again, fully safely. Now, I don't, I, I say all that really tenderly because I know there are musician friends of mine, for instance, in Florida, where Stuff has been open for a while. And of course, Miami Beach right now, it's like mayhem. Um, but if you're a gigging musician and your state opens up and the work that you had to step away from is there again and you don't have any other work, what are you gonna do? Um, for me, I, I really, uh, I'm not old or feeble enough yet to get vaccinated yet. But I, I want to make sure that I protect my own health and so that I will have, uh, in that way, I give to myself right now by sacrificing the joy I always get from performing live, knowing that sacrificing now will create a good longer term benefit. And uh, so for I've, al I've always been an exercise oriented person. So now I've, in the last year, probably like 300 days of the year, I've done some kind of exercise. Whereas when I'm in tour mode, if I'm traveling between cities, there's no chance that day that I'm doing exercise. If I'm on stage in some city I don't live in, it's not happening. You're getting uh, exercise on stage though, right? Uh, absolutely. 
yes, and I'm carrying my stuff around. There's, I'm not being sedentary at all. But as far as like actually working out, like I'm gonna go and like burn some calories and do some uh, whatever, you know, heavy breathing, running and stuff like that, that really promotes fitness. So this year I've been, had time for that. I've been involved with meditation for a long time. Um, kind of comes and goes in life, but in this last year, definitely has been a steady presence. I've had the time for it. And in a way, I think um, life has been both more calm because so, the stimulus of life has reduced, but in the same moment, as I say that, the last year was incredibly chaotic and intense. So the benefit to my uh, being of really taking the time to calm myself and understand, okay, there's a lot of weird stuff going on in the world right now with politics and the elections and uh, the way American culture is right now. Uh, so combative in the, and so equally divided between two camps almost. It, it, it seems over simple, but I think it's also quite accurate, you know? Um, and it's not like a, a mild disagreement yeah. in many cases. It's, it's a full on blow up of disagreement where it's really heightened tension. And it's troubling because I mean, I think a lot of people, I'm sure you are the same, who are really deep into music have chosen music that somehow speaks to the way they like to feel about life. You know, the messages of the music inform us and the, the, the music with messages that somehow like rings true, we like, that's where we go. Um, so for someone who's been into reggae music for decades, the, the sense of community of the not entitled, where there's a brotherhood of the underclass. And I came from a middle-class environment. I grew up with my mom, she was a school teacher. I was never hungry. We didn't have a lot of extra money, but I was never like, I don't claim to be um, anything that I'm not in that regard, but those values. And as I said, when I was a kid, I was taken to church. Stuff, you know, uh, to protect the, the meek, all of those things, those messages were poured into me early on. And I think maybe that's somehow why I connected with reggae because there's a lot of scripture and stuff in that. And it's like, you know, there's truth in, in a lot of those messages. Um, so I really value, and okay, I'll, I'll pause to say, a lot of people say, oh, reggae, that's all peace and love. Well, there's, that's not true. There's a lot of reggae. Wait, wait. That... You, uh, you broke up. What did you say? What do people oh, say about reggae? Some, some people have an impression of reggae that's all peace and love and iry, good times, beach music. But there's a lot of like reggae that's real about the hardship and the dark struggle of life and oppression and the way the Babylon system oppresses the people. And these are very real things. And when one is this taking that stimulus it, it, that affects how you view the world you know it informs your sense of how reality functions and how society works and uh what was the original point <laughs> okay <laughs> fair enough oh, what, what to do, how to how to deal with these times you're asking oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. <laughs> um i think that it is a time that's clear. There's a division in America, and I don't think that it's uh, exclusively America either. There's a battle between the left and the right to oversimplify what you're going to label, which it seems like a non-judgment left and right. We all know what, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Where there doesn't seem to be much middle ground space for agreement. There's just a battle going on, and it's like all the way this way, all the way that way, so a lot of extremes, um, 
and it is how it is. A lot of times as culture evolves over the, the long game of humanity, there are moments of intense conflict and breakthrough moments where something that wasn't part of how mankind views life, now it is. Whether it's the internet or electricity or whatever, um, major things happen that create major changes. So I think as individuals now, what we can do is work on ourselves because that's the truth of our, our reality. If I'm thankful, I have a really good long-term uh, housemate. So I'm not isolated. I have a person here that I've lived with for a number of years where it's like, oh, there's companionship if you want, if you want privacy, no problem. Um, so I really have a lot of empathy or sympathy, I don't know the correct term, for somebody who is living alone in this time where you can't go socialize at the pub or wherever, the gym. Um, that type of true isolation, I think, must be very difficult. Um, but as they say, every, uh, every obstacle is an opportunity. So if a person is struggling, um, there is the opportunity to address in a deeper way than maybe the busyness of life often affords the opportunity to say, well, what's going on? Like, I'm feeling a certain way. What's causing that? Or what can I do to change the way I feel? Because so much of life is how we feel, right? Um, and emotions and ways of thinking can be, they can be unconscious, they can be habitual, they can be very conscious. Uh, we can feed ourselves a certain whether it's reading the Bible every day, you're feeding yourself a certain message. Um, so finding the things to feed yourself, whether it's physically, spiritually, mentally, that are good, that feel good to you as a person and fortify you and strengthen you. I think that's my advice to anyone. And, and the more we all do for ourselves, the better we feel in ourselves, the more like we are more likely we are in society to be people who treat other people well. Because the people who, um, they say the, the ones who lash out, the people who cause pain are in pain. And so uh, pain is part of life as well. But if there's an opportunity to take this unforeseen free time and lack of other things to do, and, and turn it around where, well, now's the time to work on myself, whatever it can be. And it can just be, I learned how to make a really good omelet, but I feel good about that. Like I have a new skill. Yeah. And I think as well, like uh, I, I'm really blessed through life of traveling and making music to know a lot of people. And so th th I know a lot of people who are, like I say, isolated this way, if you have an opportunity, one of us, any of us, and you know somebody who lives alone and is prone to not feeling good, reach out, just say, hey, how's it going? Or like, you know, chat with somebody for 20 minutes on Facebook to make sure that they're not really, that they're doing okay. Or if they're not, then like to help them out. Because um, I know that when you reach out and you help someone else, you feel better too. Yes, that is great advice. Thank you so much. Um, that was just wonderful. Just everything, the way you talk is so very refined and I just love it. Thank you for the therapy session. <laughs> Jenna Armstrong says, this is one of my favorite episodes and it's not even over yet. Mark Ward, this has been a really cool interview. Everybody's really digging everything that you have to say. Um, <laughs> Let's see, Lindsay says you can't pour from an empty cup. Very well Very said. Very true. Yes. Um, so I know that you go live. Is it Tuesdays and Thursdays or? Uh, Thursdays. Thursdays. And you do the Blue Beat or the Blue Stream? So it's called Blue Beat Live Stream. Blue Beat. And okay. so the term Blue Beat is, uh, it relates again to the British. Um, influence of Jamaican music on Britain. So there was 
as there was a label two-tone. And so some music is known, uh, that's two-tone. Uh, there was a label called Blue Beat that was uh, made to market Jamaican music to Jamaicans in Britain. So there was, in the 60s and 70s, there was music coming out all the time in Jamaica for Jamaicans because the Jamaican music didn't have a market really outside Jamaica, except in Britain. Um, so Blue Beat was a, a label, a record label in Britain that marketed ska, rock steady, uh, reggae in Britain. So for British people, a lot of times they'll just umbrella refer to any of that stuff. Oh, ska, well, that's Blue Beat. Blue Beat is their umbrella term for any of that Jamaican music. So I ran a, a weekly show at Knitting Factory in Hollywood uh, for seven years from 2003 through 2009. Uh, it was every Tuesday. And so over those years, at 350 Tuesday shows, plus some special events. So probably about 400 shows over seven years, I was a promoter. I'd wow. never been a promoter. It was offered to me as an artist residency. And so I'm like, when uh, opportunities come, I try to say yes and figure out how to work it. Like, that's the classic advice. Like someone asked you to do something you don't know if you can do it, say yes, and then figure out how to do it, you know? And uh, so I said, yes, I wanna do this. And right away I understood it was gonna take more than me alone showing up with my acoustic guitar to make this thing thrive. That, and fortunately I was part of a scene where there's a community of many bands around Southern California and people who dig this music. So basically I started off inviting a band. So for the first couple of months, it was me and another band. Uh, so every week there'd be a new band. And then by the third month of it, it had expanded to there would be three acts on the bill. And it was that way the rest of the time. And it, it was really a, a successful, the, the room we ran it in was, I think legal capacity about 75. So not a big room. And because there were two other rooms in Knitting Factory, they could be a little flexible with, okay, we have more than 75 in this one room, but this one's kind of quiet. So in the big overall capacity, we're still okay. But in practical terms, they would sell about a hundred tickets in the room and then they'd stop selling. Plus you'd have three bands and their girlfriends or whoever, you know. So you, on a really busy night, you might get 130 people in this room rated for 75. But it was small enough that if you uh, had a night that wasn't huge and you had 50 people in there, it didn't feel dead, which really was a, a key thing for me as the promoter um, in that, first of all, I was bringing good business on a Tuesday night in a small room to Knitting Factory consistently for years. So they were really happy with me. Uh, they had other stuff going on on Fridays and big shows and all that stuff. But in their small room on a Tuesday, they were making money every week for seven years. And so they were stoked. And so if I had a slow night, it was never like, you know, you gotta get this going. They're like, oh, well, it, was, it was all right. But, and then next week's big and they're like, which gave me the opportunity to uh, let bands play that I didn't expect to be huge draws. Whether that's a touring band from New Jersey, that's their first time on the West Coast, and maybe they have a release, but they did it themselves. And no one really knows who they are, but they, they're a ska band of whatever type of ska, and they're coming to LA and they know that I do this show and they hit me up and I would do my best to find a situation to accommodate that band being on a bill. If I was in town, I was either playing solo or within the first year, uh, Chris Murray combo, which is a three piece format, drums, bass, and me and all of us singing. We were kind of like the house band from when I was in town, not on tour. So there were, there were enough bands that I, in my big stable that I could draw on local bands that even if I had a band that from out of town or just a baby band, like that was their first gig or their second gig or something, I could make it work for them. Like, oh, kids would come to the shows and I'd know these kids from like, they come and they're like, we're starting a band, can we play? 
<laughs> and I'm like, well, I know you. I know you guys are good guys and you love this and let's, I'll figure it out. And so I was able to give a lot of opportunity to bands that were lesser known. And the more well-known bands were very open to, to all of it. They knew from the start that uh, since it was a small room, they, they couldn't expect a lot of money. Even if it was a sold out show, the, the way the finances work, we always kept it at five bucks a ticket, really cheap. And so no one, no one could say, I can't afford to go. Yeah. It was very open in that way. And my deal with Knitting Factory was they kept 30% of the door. So if, if we sold 100 tickets at 500, uh, at five bucks, 500 gross, they would keep 150. I'd have 350 to, to split from a sold out night in the small room. So if it was a, the headliner brought everybody, I might be able to give them like 150, 200 bucks tops. Yeah. But they didn't expect more. But meanwhile, this band, they might play a Friday or Saturday somewhere else and they're getting seven, 800 bucks, a different vibe. But because it was such a community thing and a lot of the, the musicians from those bands were regular attendees, they're like, yeah, of course my band that's actually like well beyond the scope of this thing, well, of course we're gonna play. So it was a true community. And so that was called Blue Beat Lounge. Okay. And so when the live stream thing came up, I was like, oh, it's a natural Blue Beat live stream, just <laughs> resonating with that. And so basically your fans come and join you for about an hour and they suggest songs and you play about an hour of original and cover songs? Yes, and you know, it's, it's evolved. Like I would say more commonly I play 90 minutes. Okay. Um, oh. And then at the end it has, there's been like a, a hangout that has evolved because uh, I, I love to sing the songs and I'm reading comments on my phone as I'm standing in front of it, all these things. And I can, I get to talk to people a little bit between songs, but after a while, um, it's been, this, this Thursday will be the 52nd Thursday. Uh, is that right? Yes. This is the final Thursday of March. I, yes. yes, I think so. <laughs> so my first blue beat was the first Thursday of April, 2020. So we're coming up to the one year anniversary of it. Congratulations. So, thank you. So there's a lot of regulars and it just kind of evolved that after I was finished playing songs, I put down the guitar and I sit here just like this and I'm like, okay, let's hang out. And now people are like, maybe they got a question or there was some joke being made and they're filling me in on it or whatever it is. And week to week as well, um, sometimes I'll have themes. It, it definitely is a mix of originals and covers. Um, the reality of being a touring musician is you show up in a different city every night and you're playing more or less the same songs to different people. Now I'm playing weekly to quite a few of the same people coming every week. So I really want to mix it up. And uh, so now I have themes like this is, I had did a Bob Marley Wailers thing where I did a bunch of Bob Marley tunes. Um, so I'm learning a lot of material that I didn't know before, which is really great. That's awesome. How, um, I want to talk a little bit about your discography. I, okay. I need to, I need to step away for two minutes oh, or one ahead. minute oh, you're for a bathroom break. Yeah, 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 go for it. Hello, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. I appreciate you guys so much. Nene, Ram, Jen Armstrong, Lindsay, Dawn, Mark. Um, I see all you guys out there, Mar Hill, Leaf, Jacob Gonzalez. What is everybody up to tonight? I hope you are enjoying our chat um, with the legendary Chris Murray. What's everybody up to tonight? Are you seeing my digs? I got the Razafari supporting Juan Love. Um, you guys go and support Razafari and go check out his amazing clothing. Uh, what's up, Brian Monroe? How you doing? Everybody that won uh, prizes last week, make sure that you email me if I have not already emailed you guys um, to pick out your merch items and to get the rest of your goodies. I keep looking at the faces that I'm making and it's cracking me up. I'm very animated tonight. 
I love all you guys so much. Thank you all for hanging out. Hope you guys are having a lovely night. Tomorrow night, I have the one and only DJ Dusty Grammy nominated DJ and producer. Thursday, no, Wednesday, I have the former bass player for NERD, Pharrell Williams Band. And on Thursday, I have the one and only Sophia. What's up? You're back. Hello. Perfect. <laughs> cool. So where were we at? You were about to ask something. Oh, your discography. So huh. I like clicked on one of your songs earlier. I was literally listening to like, I put it on one song and like three hours later, I'm just like on this playlist, <laughs> which I'm like, okay, this man has a ton of songs. And not only that, but I see that you're on a German like soundtrack or something musical maybe. There is another artist named Chris Murray, who is a German opera singer. <laughs> so there have been uh, confusing uh, tags and stuff along some years. Good to know, Chris Murray, because I was trying to hear you in the opera, and I'm like, well, he must just have like a very operatic voice. I don't know. I wish I had that voice. <laughs> I I'm happy with the voice I have, but it's... Um, so you have a a typical Facebook profile. Do you have an artist page at all? Um, I do. You know? yeah. okay. I have a business page too. So you know that they're they're doing some changes right now. There's the new pages experience. Oh, just like they do. Like every so often, we're just changing stuff because change feels fresh or something. Oh. And then you got to relearn how to do stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, they just have been changing some stuff. So I've been relearning how to use some aspects of my pages, um, which is a bit of a drag. Cause you know, you get your stuff dialed in and you're just like, why do you need to change it? It's working for me. But the thing that that changed that really did work for me was by some glitch. If I posted on Facebook, my artist page URL, which is facebook.com slash Chris Murray roots. And if I push that, then it would show the preview, the thumbnail of my image there correctly. But if you click through, it would link to the Spotify for the German opera singer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this was like several years of this. And of course, I sent numerous uh, customer support requests to Facebook. There's no customer support. They're like, and... Uh, I mentioned a couple times just on my stream, does anyone know how to deal with this kind of situation? And a few people are like, oh yeah, I know how to do it. And they're like, they look at it and they're like, oh, I don't know how to deal with this. So anyway, <laughs> they fixed that. So now, now I can like post the link to my own thing and it comes to me for the first time in years. So I'm like, yes, some victory in the, all of it. Okay, so scratch the German musical. Um, but your discography is still long and intense and I just, you know, I'm on some of you, I, I do like to join your live streams a lot and I just see, and I'm one of those people too, like, oh, play Jenny Jones or Janie Jones. What's Jenny the name Jones. Of yeah, play Dinosaurs, play, you know, Rocksteady, The Real Ska, you know, I'm one of those people too, but it seems like you just have everything memorized and dialed in. Like, how do you keep the memory juices going up there? Well, this has been a real special year in that regard. Um, so I started to say how typically as a touring artist, you're going city to city and you probably have like a couple dozen songs that are in heavy rotation. Like for me, I go to a city, I need to play rock steady. I need to play home, X darling, one, everything shades of the same color. There's a bunch of songs, which are my standards uh, and they've accumulated over years. So as they do, like I can't go somewhere and not play We Do The Sky. Like, that would be not doing what I need to do as an entertainer in that moment. Like people came because they love this song. Of course I'm gonna play it. So it limits the number of other songs that I get to play. So I have a lot of songs that don't get played on stage because there are songs that must be played on stage. And so the difference now with uh, the live stream where I'm playing weekly, and there's a lot of people who are coming every week. As I said, oh, the themes allow me to, to make variety. So 
a good friend of mine who I had a, a songwriting project with called Caps Lock. There's some cool stuff. It's, it's a little sky and reggae, but it's all over the place as well. We have a Caps Lock Songs is our home on Facebook. Okay. So she made this YouTube channel for me where from the footage of the, the various live streams, if I played a song that I hadn't played before, she separated that two, three minutes and, that, and put it up on the YouTube channel. So she basically documented all of the individual songs that I played. And she was like a Christmas present for me. She's like, so by that time, there had been eight months of Blue Beat live stream, a bunch of shows. There were more than 200 individual songs. Right. So that blew my mind. So I, I definitely, I'm living it. So I know like at the end of every day and at, at the end of this, I'm going to go into my room and sing songs for 90 minutes. Some of them I'm, I'm learning every day. I'm learning material. And there were years, years past of normal life where I got my 24 songs that I have to play everywhere. And I know a ton of songs for sure, but don't really have the opportunity to play them. So this has been really good for me this year. Uh, a silver lining of it is that it's forced me and allowed me to play, to learn songs that I loved, but never took the time to properly learn or like, you know, you know, half of the lyrics, but you don't really, you couldn't perform it. So, oh, I'm going to go to school on stuff, which as a writer is always helpful. Like if you are learning to sing a great song, somebody else wrote as a writer, you're learning a, about how this great song operates, whether it's like, oh, the bridge happens here or this turn of phrase. Uh, I think as this time has helped me develop my craft in, in many ways, um, as far as remembering it all, it's a lot. Uh, and, and there are songs that I learned six months ago to play for one stream that if I were going to play it again, I would really need to refresh on it. But over time, I've also been pretty good as far as putting together a lyric sheet. If I learn a new song on my laptop, I've got a lyric sheet. It tells me what key it's in. And more or less, I know the song. Yeah. So during the live stream, I'll be uh, streaming through my phone, but I'll have a laptop. My laptop's older. It's not like stream worthy, but it's got some, some uh, text files there that really get me through. It's like, oh, someone wants to hear this song. Okay, here's the lyrics. Oh yeah, that's how the third verse goes. And it's in A flat, okay. And that gets me through. Because once stuff is in there, it's in there. But when you have like hundreds of songs in your head and you haven't played one for six months, and sometimes songs are similar, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> You had mentioned that um, like when we're done here, you'll go into your room and you'll practice. So do you, e even now, you still practice every day? Yeah, more, more than ever. Because um, I would say through the Blue Beat Lounge era of the aughts, when Chris Murray Combo was a newer band and the house band had a weekly show. It was, we had the same thing going on. We, were, we had a weekly show locally so we were always working up new stuff to keep that fresh. We were not really a touring band. Um, but when I tour solo, I, I, don't need, I don't need to rehearse as far as, I know how to sing rock steady. Yeah. Like, I'm never gonna forget it. <laughs> and uh, so now, uh, I, and I love to sing, uh, and I love to sing these songs, so, uh, I have time and you know sometimes like if you're on tour for a week or a couple of weeks and you've sung on stage whatever eight times over a couple of weeks you come home probably you're not gonna be like oh wow I want to just go and sing like okay now I just want to flake out because you've been on tour but I don't have that thing that I'm flaking out just getting over I'm like no I I just had a a nice day I did some gardening and laundry and bought my groceries and did some cooking and you know meditated and all of that stuff now it's time to sing songs and I look forward to that and it's definitely part of my quarantine lifestyle I love that so I've, I've rehearsed far more this year 
than other years because of the time and because of the opportunity to present less uh, common material to, to people every week. So there'll, there'll be people who come to Blue Beat who have seen me perform more than 200 different songs. And I really appreciate that. It's like when you hang out with any people, even online, week after week for a year, you have a true sense of community. You know, you yeah. get to know people that you've never met in person, but you know their personality from their comment. Oh, this one's funny. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that I've kept you a lot longer than I originally told you. So we're going to start wrapping stuff up. I just want to touch on one other thing really quick. You're the amount of places you've traveled to is insane. You've gone to, obviously you're from Canada, but Europe, the UK, Japan, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, South Korea, Indonesia, Australia, and New Zealand. Do you have a favorite place? Uh, I have I have multiple places I love. I'll say that. I, I don't think that there's a favorite place. Um, I've been really fortunate, as, as you outlined, to go a lot of places and a lot of places I've gone again and again. So for instance, like to the UK, I've probably toured in the UK 15 times. Wow. Which means like I, I get off the National Express coach at the bus station and I get off and I know where I am and I know I walk up three blocks here and I turn left and the club's over there and, and these people are gonna be there and I'm gonna stay with these people and they had a kid since I was here last time, or they, I'm going to see their dog again. They got a cool dog. So I have um, a sense of the world that's active, that is not just uh, my locality. And so there are places that are cool, but ultimately, I mean, people are what shape my feeling about places. And there are good people everywhere. So uh, even if it's the least glamorous place. I'm there with good people and we're having a good time and sharing music. Uh, it's a great experience. Now, I really value as a person, as I said before, I've never gone anywhere as a tourist. Like when I, my, my mom's not a traveler and we didn't have a lot of extra money for travel. Um, so we didn't. It wasn't until King Apparatus started really touring in the US that I, when we started touring in Canada, then I saw Canada. And then we started to do the US and we never went to Europe as a band. But even just touring in North America opens your eyes to stuff that you just don't see when you are just in your hometown. And um, so to go to many countries has really educated me as a, a person about how life is, and of course, at the, I think the bottom level core information relating to people is, okay, yes, things are different. Here's details and ways, little customs and things that are different place to place. But at core level, people are very much the same. Uh, you know, the, the thing that makes us human is the same in every person. And it's a real good learning experience to go to a place where you don't like, okay, I'm a white male, hetero male. I'm like the classic, what, it, what's the word? Like the, uh, the world is dumped on my lap just because of these, these aspects of me. Um, I've, I've been in some neighborhoods where being white made me a target or people were like giving me a hard time and stuff like that. And now I've been to many countries where, like when I went to Indonesia, that was a, a beautiful trip. Um, I was invited to play the Semarang Ska Festival, the first one. I think they've done a few since then. Um, and Semarang is the second city on Java. Jakarta is the, the main city. And so Semarang has a few million people. It's a big city. and. People hit me up on Facebook, like, would you come and play? And they were bringing this artist, Mr. T-Bone from Italy, who I hadn't met in person yet, but I knew who he was. And it's like, well, if they're bringing him, it's probably legit. 
And I just, I love to know the world. And as a solo act, that has been made it so possible to go to a lot of places that it can be expensive to buy a flight to Australia or Indonesia. So if you've got one person, a festival can make it work. If you're trying to bring three or four people with you, it's like, this is way out of possibility. So there were times in Semarang where, of course, I got there and I was there for a week. I saw, other than myself, three other white faces the whole week. One was the guy from Italy and the two others were two girls who were like Slovenian and they were backpackers. They were like, you know, out to see the world. And when I was taken around, like, oh, we're going to have dinner here or we're just going to go around in public, people would ask, can we take a photograph with him? And it wasn't, they didn't know I was a musician. They didn't know anything. They're just like a white person. And it would be a bit of a procession sometimes. It's like, now you're taking a picture with the wife. Now you're taking a picture with the husband. Now you're taking a picture of them together with the kid. <laughs> I, I ate at some food stand and they made me sign it. They didn't know who I was, but I'm just like, I'm from America. So to experience that type of world, like where I am such an exotic creature um, and people are so open and uh, everywhere people are very open and, and giving, I find. Um, I've been to Mexico a lot and in, in Toronto where I grew up, there are Latinos, but not, nothing like Southern California. Um, so to experience, uh, I have some really great friends in Mexico because I've been there probably 15 times nice. and stayed in family homes and people gave up their bed so I could be in the bed and, you know, just full on love there. And to, I think that every person who, isn't exposed to something is ignorant of it until they're exposed to it. And ignorant is a word that sometimes is laden with judgment. But I think it's just the truth. Like, unless you know from experience something, you are ignorant of it. And so in the same, in that way, I was ignorant of everything I'd never seen before, before I saw it. And so when you're a guest or visitor in a country where you don't speak the language and you are clearly from somewhere else. Uh, and you're treated so well and, and given such uh, a warm welcome and uh, brought into people's homes and any, anything you could need, like, can we give it for you? You see a lot of times people don't have a lot, but they would give you anything they had to help your moment be comfortable. And so the experiences I've had with people in, in many places around the world, uh, I've had some some of the most grand, luxurious experiences, like stayed in, wow, this hotel is amazing. And like I say, I've slept on countless floors and I don't mind sleeping on the floor at all. Um, to know how life is and that, I think at the bottom line, the thing that fortifies me as a person is that Probably when I grew up in the suburbs of Toronto, there were like certain ways that life was supposed to be that I was ingrained with. Like life is supposed to be like this, not supposed to be like that. And then when I traveled and seen life be many different places at different ways, um, to know that no, life can be all kinds of ways and it's fine. You know, uh, you can have everything, you can have nothing. You can have everything and be unhappy. You can have almost nothing and be happy. And um, you can have not much and you don't have to be ashamed that you don't have much. Um, you can be self-assured as a person without the trappings of material success. And I think, uh, so the world is my favorite place is my short answer. Every part of it that I've traveled to has taught me something about the world and about myself. Wow, that was a great answer. <laughs> oh my gosh, I just, thank you so much. Ah, I, my pleasure. 
I appreciate you and just I'm going to go back over and watch this episode and take notes because you said so many amazing things. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up because I think this might be my longest show I've ever had. Wow. <laughs> so thank you again. I want you guys, everybody at home, please follow Chris Murray. Um, he's linked up on the top. Go follow him and go check out his Blue Beat. Blue Beat live stream. Blue Beat live stream on Thursday. Thursday at 5 Pacific at facebook.com slash Chris Murray Roots. Awesome. And I'll make sure to share it. I share it in my base group um, every time that I see it. Um, so I will definitely share it again on Thursday. Uh, Victor Reyes says, listening to this, I feel the need to save some traveling funds. Ah. <laughs> and Brian Monroe said, can I be your roadie man? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Right, uh, put it, manifest stuff, manifest stuff, everybody, put it in the universe. Um, this has been a fun episode, you guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me, Chris. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. My pleasure, Sunshine. Um, you guys, until next time, stay safe, keep smiling, and don't forget to rock and roll. <laughs> Bye, Chris. All right, peace. Thanks, everyone.